Okay, it's Wednesday, June 20th, 2018, and I'm sitting with Ted Hoyle in his apartment in Penn South to talk with him about this for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you. I'm glad to be a part of it. Great, great. So can you tell me where and when you were born and a little bit about how you grew up? I was born in Huntsville, Alabama in 1942. Um, I, we never lived in Huntsville. My father was an engineer and he was working on something um, called, I think they call it the Redstone uh, Arsenal, and he was one of the engineers that were sent down there to work on that particular project. And my mother was pregnant and she went with him, of course, and I happened to be born there in Huntsville. But I don't remember anything about Huntsville because I'm, I think I was maybe six or six or eight months old when his part of the project was completed and we went back to South Carolina and I grew up in South Carolina. Um, I, I lived in a, a, a comfortable home. We, it was a very musical household. My mother played the piano. My father's mother was a piano teacher um, so there was always music in the house. Uh, I ended up having a um, a younger, uh, I'm sorry, an old, a uh, younger sister, yes, I was correct, younger sister, maybe two and a half years younger than I am, who still lives in South Carolina, and then a brother who's seven years younger who lives in the area down there as well. I'm still in touch with them. Uh, we have a very good relationship. Um, let's see, what else? I, I went to public schools in, in uh, the town I grew up in is called Spartanburg. It's in the northwest corner of the state. Uh, it was a very musical town, so I was very involved in the musical life of the town. I studied piano, organ, cello. Um, what else? Uh, I went to the local high school. Uh, I, I'm always amazed now you hear so much on television about kids being bullied and this and that. I mean, I just didn't, I'm, that didn't exist when I was growing up. If, if it did, I was totally unaware of it. I certainly was not bullied at all. Our high school valued, uh, I was not uh, sports oriented, but they, I was very musical, so I was very involved in the orchestra and musical events. Uh, and high school, they valued that. And so you were not considered a geek or a nerd or whatever. Uh, I was in the key club. Um, I, I dated girls. I, I was not aware of the fact that I was gay at the time. I, I, I must say, I remember thinking, uh, because I had grown up with these same people since kindergarten, and, um, and then all of a sudden, at adolescence, all of the boys just were nuts about the girls, and I thought, oh, that's nice, but gee, I, I'm, they, I mean, gosh, it seems like overdone. I couldn't quite figure it out, but I, I didn't really pay too much attention to that, and then... Uh, and I wasn't, being, I wasn't overtly aware that I was attracted to boys or anything like that or young men. Um, I didn't have any sexual experiences when I was a kid at all. I, as I say, I dated girls and we would go to key club dances or this or that. But, uh, and also, I must say, at the time I thought uh, dancing I found to be a chore. But I did it because that's what you did. And it wasn't until many years later that I really discovered what dancing was all about. Uh, but that, so then I, uh, after high school, I uh, had decided, and I, my parents were, uh, I had told them, and they were very supportive. I guess I was about 14 or 15, and I said, you know, I really think I want to make a life in music. And they said, well, you realize, I was very good in math and science as well, and for a long time I thought that's the direction in which I would go, and my father was very happy about that, because as I say, he was a civil engineer. And... Um, but then when I said, but I was studying music and they supported that and paid for the lessons, of course. And then I said to them about that time, well, I think I'm gonna go into music. And they said, okay. They both warned me. They said, well, you'll never make any money. How true they were. Uh, but uh, they said, if that's what you wanna do, we'll do our best to send you to really fine teachers and schools. And they did. And I ended up going to the Eastman School of Music in Rochester and uh, and then after that, I went to graduate school in New Haven at Yale. And then after that, I was I went on. I was I had a Fulbright to France and studied there. And then I moved back to New York, and I've been here ever since. So tell me more about what what were you studying? I, I played the cello. So of course, when you were at the Eastman School of Music, I was a music major. 
but it all centered around playing the cello. So I took chamber music classes. Of course, you had to take music theory, music history, all of, all of that. That was all required. Uh, and I played piano as a secondary instrument. I studied some organ uh, because I had done that very seriously as a teenager as well and played in churches. Um, so that, uh, but cello was really my first love. And I think I mentioned to you earlier, I was on a, a tour with an orchestra, a State Department tour. That was through the Eastman School of Music. It was sponsored by the State Department, but it was through that connection and they sent a group of us and a very it was a student orchestra but they really drilled us and so it was a very professional orchestra and they sent us away for three months and we toured all over Europe um, you know um, we were everywhere in Europe from Stockholm to Athens to uh, Nicosia Cyprus to Cairo to uh, Aleppo to Beirut then we spent a, some time in Poland and then an entire month in well, in those days, it was called the Soviet Union. And we played in, uh, well, Leningrad it was called then. Now it's St. Petersburg, uh, again. And Moscow and lots of other smaller towns. And so, and then after that, I went to graduate school. And it was in graduate school that I met my first lover. And that was uh, Leslie Rosen, who was the painter. I mean, I should point it, well, that's the painting of his behind me. Um, so tell me, when did you... When did you, do you remember when you first sort of had an inkling, like, oh, maybe it's boys I like? Yes. <laughs> I, was a, I was at the Eastman School of Music. I was a senior. I, I was a very late bloomer. I, you know, the kids now, they know when they're like eight or nine or ten. I'm just, I'm always, I think that's how great for them. Although I was not unhappy or anything like that. I, but I knew something was missing, and I kept telling myself, oh, you're just a late bloomer. Really late bloomer, as it turned out. Well, I went to the lounge in the uh, dormitory at, at the Eastman School, the men's dorm, and on the table was a book, uh, a paperback, and I just sort of idly picked it up and just, just was thumbing through it. The name of the book was City of Night by John Ritchie, which is a gay novel. Now, it's a part of gay life that I never was involved with, and that he was, it was an autobiographical novel about when he was a male hustler in New York and L.A., New Orleans. But what it did for me is like, oh, oh, there's this other world that I had no idea about. And that's when I finally realized, oh, this is, that's probably what it is. And although I had no idea or any notion that I wanted to go out and go and stand on a street corner and solicit I just knew that, that I was probably gay and wanted to be with men and I wanted to explore that. And I, it took me a while. I mean, I finally uh, did it and I came out basically when I was in grad school in New Haven. And I mentioned earlier about the dancing thing. Well, there was one, I had heard when I went off to school there that there was one gay bar, but I didn't know the name of it. I didn't know where it was. And so I wasn't really actively looking for it because, number one, I was in school. I was very busy. I didn't have a lot of time on my hands. But during um, one January break, uh, I was there in New Haven. It was very cold and snowy, and I had to get books for the next semester. So I went down to Chapel Street, and there were several bookstores. And I was uh, went and I found the books that I was looking for. And then I th and I remember thinking to myself, "Gee, it would be really nice to just have a beer." And there, I passed this place, and I thought, well, I'll go in and have a beer. So I went into this place. It was a restaurant and a bar on the side. And I went into the bar, and there were very few patrons. It was about 5 o'clock, although it was about dark. It was dark. And uh, I ordered a beer, and I sat there. And all of a sudden, I overhear this conversation. And there were no women in the bar, which I found a little odd. It was a very long and narrow bar. And then I overheard someone say, and then... He was wearing a picture hat, and I was thinking, what? And then I thought, oh my God, this must be the gay bar. And so I had my beer, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to come back here later tonight and just check this place out. And sure enough, that was the local gay bar. It was called The Pub. And it was a well, it, the restroom part was a rather well-known uh, part of uh, New Haven uh, restaurant life, and so I was quickly advised by students I met in there that night 
don't ever come in the front door, go in the back door because you don't want to be seen coming into this place. So from then on, I snuck in the back door like everybody else, if you were going to the bar. Because the straight patrons who were attend going to the restaurant, which was a very fine restaurant, by the way, uh, would go in the front door. And the weird thing about it in Connecticut in those days, if you could believe this law, as I mentioned earlier, it was a very long and narrow bar, and there was some kind of crazy law in Connecticut that women could not sit at a bar or be anywhere closer than three feet, or some weird law, and that's why women were not allowed in the bar. And so, of course, that law, I'm sure, is kaput by now, should be. Uh, and so the bar was all male, and it turned into, it had, and became a gay bar, and so I, I would go in there periodically, and I met a number of people from Yale University there, um, and I eventually came out. And one of the people I met there was a, a man, and he all he would tell me was that he worked for the state of Connecticut. I later found out he was a Connecticut state trooper. I only wish I had known that at the time. It's a fantasy, you know, it's a porn movie. And he once, one night, he said, let's go dancing. And I said, dancing? Where are we going to go dancing? And I thought, and I don't even like to dance. So he said, well, there's a place up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I said, well, that's awfully far away. And I had something the next day I had to do. I was playing a, a kitty performance or something. And I said, well, I, can, I, I really don't think I... He, no, we'll just go up for the night. We'll go dancing. We'll spend the night. We'll come back early in the morning. I'll drive you back. Okay, so we went. And we went to this bar that was a dancing bar in those days, they called them. And we were slow dancing. And I thought, oh... This is what dancing is all. It finally clicked. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm certainly rambling, so I'll let you ask another question. No, that was beautiful. Thank you. So what year was that that you went to the pub? Do you remember? Well, I was in grad school from 64. This would have been 65. January, I went in there in January of 65. And... What vocabulary did you have? Like, how did you, what were you calling yourself when you were realizing? Well, by that time, I had accepted the fact that I was gay. And once, once that realization came to me, for me, it was just like opening, walking through a door. It's like, okay, fine, this, this is it. And I did not, uh, well, I didn't much particularly want to go home and tell my parents. But I wasn't racked with guilt about the whole thing. And then, of course, I had met all these other students at Yale who were also gay, and they were living very happy, comfortable lives. And so I never went through this horrible anguish and, oh dear, and am I, should I kill myself? None of that. I, I, that never. It took me a while to come to grips about, well, I've got to deal with my parents and my brothers and sisters. And that did take a while. But I was lucky, and when I finally did let them know, and it kind of just sort of dribbled out in bits and pieces, uh, they were very supportive. I, I remember one thing my father did. My father and mother had come to New York uh, for a visit. And at that time, Leslie and I were back from France, and we were living together. But I also had a little studio about, about a block away. So I said well, to my parents, well, you stay in the studio, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll be a roommate with Leslie. Yeah, right. So, um, but at the time, I was teaching at a university, and I was also playing a Broadway show. So I was working seven days a week. So I said to Leslie, I said, you know, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do with my parents. They're here for a week, and I'm working all the time. Would you at least in the evenings do something with them, take them to dinner? So he did, and he was an artist. And one of the things he did is he took them, in those days, it, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was open late on Tuesday nights. And he took them there and took them all around. And he was very knowledgeable, of course, being an artist. And um, at the end of the trip, I remember my father came to me and says, you know, I really like your friend Leslie. He said, you would do well to stick with someone like that. And so that was kind of his way of saying, you know, I know and it's okay. And so that's how, I, I never officially came out to my parents, but they kind of, they were both educated and they figured it out and they were perfectly cool. And of course now, of course, they're gone, but my sister, she loves Ray and my brother as well, everybody, and the same thing is true with his family. So we're lucky in the sense that I hear stories about people. I don't really know many people who have been rejected by their families, but it's apparently not uncommon, but we have never suffered that fate. And That's really lucky. That is great. It's very lucky.
Yeah. And when you were at Yale, um, even though you were meeting other students, did you feel like you had to be careful and you, you had to navigate? Yes. I, yeah, I, I definitely did. I did not want to broadcast it. it. There was no question that you, nowadays, you know, kids come out, they, you know, they take a date of the same sex to the prom. I mean, in my day, that would have been just unheard of. At least for me, I couldn't have done it. I, I mean, now, it wouldn't be a problem, but uh, th we're talking about an awfully long time ago. And uh, gay was just kind of a thing unspoken. Uh, so I didn't make any bones about it. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't go to great lengths to hide it. I remember once giving a party and inviting, uh, I didn't even realize it at the time, I wasn't thinking about it, uh, I invited friends. Well, a lot of them, of course, were male. Well, and of course, in those days, there was another thing, too. Yale was mostly, uh, it, the grad school was uh, co-ed, but not the undergraduate school. So most people that I met there were male anyway, uh, but, I, but uh, in the music school where I was studying, there were, of course it was co-ed, and I invited some of the girls and they came, there were two, uh, I remember them very well. One of them was, well, maybe I shouldn't say her name, although hell, I don't think she would care, her name was Lucy Cross, and uh, she came from a well-to-do family, uh, you've heard of the Wilbur Cross uh, Parkway, well that was her grandfather. And Lucy was uh, a lesbian, she was out, still living in New York, and she uh, came to the party, and then the other, uh, but she knew what the party was all about. The other woman, who was my pianist at the time, did not. And to this day, when I run into her, and she'll say to me, and I'll never forget that time that you and Bob Hill gave a party, and Lucy Cross and I were the only girls there. <laughs> so, and it's true, they were. At least the only, uh, uh, appropriately female, <laughs> I mean, what is it called, <laughs> anatomically correct females. And how did you meet Leslie? Uh, I had, I was in my final year at the school, at Yale, Yale School of Music, and I had to do a big, huge recital, big, big deal. So I was working night and day on that, and I didn't have time to socialize, and I thought, you know, if I want to do, have any sexual activity, I don't have time to pussyfoot around in a bar, and, you know, and of course in those days they didn't have the internet. So I just made this bold decision that I was going to come to New York City and go to a bathhouse. In those days there was a very infamous bathhouse right here on 28th Street called the Everard Baths. And I knew about it, and I borrowed like $10 from my roommate, Bob Hill, at the time. He was studying, uh, he was doing a PhD in music history, and we had an apartment together off campus. And of course he knew exactly, what I told him what it was for. And I thought, I'll come down here, it was in January, because I knew, and the recital was in March, and I thought, this is it. This is my one time to blow off a little steam here. So I, the 10 bucks, as I recall, of course memory is faulty, was enough to get a round trip ticket on the New Haven Railroad to New York City, and to, uh, get a locker in the bathhouse. So I did, and right off the bat, the very first person I met was Leslie. And uh, the Everard bathhouse was uh, deliciously low. Let me just put it that way, it was quite sleazy. And he said, let's get out of here. And I said, well, I don't, have a, I don't live in New York, I don't have a place. He said, well, I have an apartment, let's go there. So we did, and that's how I met him. What year was that? 68. And then he came with you when you uh, went on a Fulbright? Yes, what happened was uh, he was teaching uh, in a high school here in New York City. He was an artist, but he t always taught in a high school to sort of make ends meet because selling paintings. He sold some, but he wasn't. In those days, the big, uh, the big uh, popular artists were all abstract expressionists, and he, as you can see, was not. <laughs> so. Uh, he was not exactly a great success mo monetarily, so he taught in the high school. And I had just sort of, in a very flip way, in my final year when I was in New Haven, they, I, my teacher said, well, you know, you could get, why don't you apply for a Fulbright? And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, well. Well, I did. And I, I did it, well, I did, you know, the application and the audition and everything, but I didn't think too much about it. I totally forgot about it. Well, bless my soul. 
that April, I get a letter saying, you have a Fulbright to study for a year in France. And it was like, what? Uh, so, because I was originally thinking of, uh, my teacher had already, uh, there at the New Haven had said, uh, he was Brazilian. In fact, he's still there, believe it or not, Aldo Paraso. He's, um, gosh, he's 90 now. Um, but he was Brazilian, and at that time there was an opening for a cellist, uh, uh, first cellist in the radio orchestra of Rio, and he had said to me, do you, you know, I have, you know, that would be a good job for you. And I was planning on doing that. And then all of a sudden this Fulbright, which I had totally forgotten about, came through. And then I thought, well, I guess I should do that. So I told Leslie, and the first thing he said was, you're going to turn it down, aren't you? Because by that time, Leslie and I had been, every weekend, we, I would either come to New York, or he would come to New Haven. So we were an item. And I said, well, no, no, I, I can't turn it down. Uh, so much to my surprise, he quit his job. But gave up his an apartment and it was a rent controlled apartment, which you know, and you don't do that. And put his furniture in storage, and he came to France with me. And we lived la vie bohème. We it was very much like that. We I had a little stipend, uh, stipend from Fulbright, and he had a few, uh, a little bit of money he had saved, and we bought we rented a little. Uh, it was a seven-floor walk-up in the Ninth Arrondissement. Now, the Ninth Arrondissement in those days was pretty seedy. Nowadays, I've been back, and I thought, oh, my boy, they cleaned this place up. <laughs> but in those days, it was, not, it was not exactly a very fancy place at all. And so we rented this apartment, and um, I was studying uh, with uh, Andre Navarro, who was at the Conservatoire, although I was studying with him mostly at his apartment, which was right down the street. from the, uh, My lessons were with him, but we usually didn't do it at the conservatory, we did it at his apartment. And Leslie was studying at École de Beaux-Arts. And so we had a year of uh, la vie bohème, as I said, you know, living the bohemian life. And we had friends that we met. Um, and those days, well, when I met Leslie, he smoked a lot of pot. I'd never smoked pot in my life. So uh, when we went to France, uh, he was afraid we couldn't get pot there. That was a very naive assumption, because <laughs> we found out once we got there, well, pot, they didn't smoke so much pot, but boy, did they smoke a lot of hashish. So he said, well, we're going to take pot with us. And so we bought a whole bunch of pot and cleaned it, and then he took my cello case, and, you know, it's padded. And so he took, with a razor blade, very carefully took out the stuffing, and we put the pot in plastic bags, and then he stuffed it back in and then glued it up. And, I mean, talk about fools rushing in where angels fear to tread. We get to customs in France, we put on pinstripe suits, slap Fulbright stickers all over everything, and just marched right through customs. In the meantime, on the ship, we had met two women, Judy and Brenda, that we were friends with, and still, well, Leslie's no longer living, but I'm still friends with Judy and Brenda. Brenda ended up being with the UN for many years and now lives in Cambridge and Judy lives here in New York. And so uh, Judy smoked pot and she came by our room and smelled grass and not, just knocked on the door. And we didn't know who she was, and, but she let it be known right off the bat. And she was an artist too. But she and Leslie really didn't quite see eye to eye on art because you can see the kind of art he does. She painted uh, with a spray gun on big uh, pieces of plastic. So their idea of art were uh, like polar opposites. But we still became good friends. And I was, uh, and uh, so we hung out with them in Paris a lot and um, uh, smoked a lot of grass and hashish. Not so much uh, Judy, yes, yeah, she liked it. Uh, Brenda was, she never smoked a lot. She never uh, found it uh, appealing. Okay. okay. Where, where, how far back do we have to go? I'm just rambling. I should. You're, be... No, this is perfect. Uh, you you're sure? It's right beautiful. After things were put into the cello case. Okay. Right, right at uh, pinstripe suits. Okay. That made me laugh. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, today that. My hair you know. Also hear your phone. Oh, I mean, when I think about it. Yeah. Well, of course they have dogs and all kinds of things. Well, and today, I'm yeah. seem to be some. Um, 
I'm like a magnet for being searched. I get thoroughly searched frequently. And every time I feel like I've done something naughty and I haven't. All right. And I'm like, what is it about me? Well, you know. Well, one of the things, but we're back to the whole idea of that we had Let's put. Hold for this. Okay. Yeah, have your break. Okay. And then we'll start. Mar? So why don't you start? Um, I guess with the with the boat though, right? Okay. So. Uh, so I'm still here. Sorry. New York. It was very clean up until then. Maybe there's something happening. But isn't that part of living in New York? Yeah. I don't think. Are we good? I, yeah, so, so why don't you tell me about the boat and how you, um, the friends you made on the boat? Well, uh, we met Judy and Brenda through Judy because Leslie and I were in, uh, uh, in a, a room uh, smoking pot. Of course, you could smell it. Judy smelled it as she walked by. She just knocked on the door. She didn't know who we were. And uh, we became friends, and then she and she had met Brenda on the ship, and so Brenda and Judy and Leslie and I became sort of a, a, a foursome. And then we were all we all had uh, well, Leslie didn't have a Fulbright, but he was going to be studying at Ecole de Beaux Arts, and the other three of us had Fulbrights. Brenda was studying in the uh, economics at one of the schools there, the uh, famous Poly. I forget now the name of it, but anyway, she, that's where she was, and then. Uh, Judy was an artist, and she was studying uh, art there. And uh, Leslie, of course, was uh, studying art at the École de Beaux Arts, but not through a Fulbright. And I was studying also music there. So we all became friends, and we hung out a lot together. And uh, I know that Leslie did at least one nude portrait of Brenda, and I assume she has it. It was it was like a pencil drawing, and we had dinner together and stuff like that. I mean, I didn't know how to cook. In those days, I couldn't cook. And I remember once giving a dinner party and telling them that come that I was going to cook duck a la orange. Now, I, know, I didn't know how to cook that. But I figured, well, it's just a duck, and you put a lot of oranges on it and cook it in the oven or something. Uh, so I had gone to the market. And, and in those days, you had to go every day because this uh, the apartment originally didn't have a refrigerator in it, and I, we told the landlady, look, we're not taking this place unless you put a refrigerator in it. So she put this little itty bitty half thing in it. At least it was, you know, you could keep things cool. And I bought a, a chicken and a duck. And then, so that night I cooked what I thought was the duck. And everybody kept saying, boy, this sure tastes like, I don't know, it's not a chicken, it's a duck. And the next day, I pulled out what I thought was going to be the chicken. And I thought, wait a minute, this is not a chicken. It's the duck. So I had made chicken a la orange. I'm a better cook than that now, I think. I would at least know the difference between a duck and a chicken. I didn't. And so was that 1968, 69 mm -hmm. that you were there? Yeah. And could you live openly as two men together in Paris? You know, we, we didn't go to bars very much. We were together. Uh, I, we did. I, I don't know. Uh, I never felt uh, everybody in the neighborhood. We would go down and uh, buy. You know, you'd go to the shop to buy the milk and the butter, or the shop to buy the charcuterie or whatever. And everybody knew us, and they knew we were Americans. And we, I would practice French with them, um, and they were very nice. Uh, there was some hostility in those days, because uh, especially among some of the younger French uh, uh, people, because of the Vietnam War. And the French had been there before and realized what a quagmire it was. And then, of course, the Americans stepped in, and we were equally involved in something that was just this endless quagmire, and it cost tons of lives and a horrible thing. And so the French were very opposed to our being there. Uh, I look back now and think, well, they were absolutely right. We shouldn't have been there. But at the time, I was very apolitical. I didn't really... but they. We rarely ran across anything. Once in a while, somebody would say something about you, you Americans shouldn't be there, and so forth. And, but other than that, and we didn't, uh, I remember at one point, uh, Leslie, uh, we went, there was a bar we went to, and they were having a costume party. 
And Leslie was, uh, was uh, recruited by these French uh, gay men, and they were, uh, these guys were going to be in drag, and they were going to do it sort of like a tableau vivant of, Ro of a West Side Story. Maria and um, who was her friend, the one that uh, Rita Moreno played it in the, in the movie. I, you know who I'm talking about. Anita. Maria, Anita, and then lastly was going to be Tony, and I wasn't in it, but there was somebody else who was the other male. And uh, I remember, and they all dressed up in the parts, and of course the guys were in drag, Maria and Anita, the French, those two French guys, and they won second place. And they were furious at, at the two French guys. Of course, we didn't even know them at all. And there was a fist fight broke out because the two guys who were in drag, mind you, which is quite funny when you think about it, uh, between the two French guys who were in drag against the people who won first place. And I don't remember what their little tableau was, but whatever it was, they, they won first place and, and the West Side Story came in second. And that did not set well with the two French queens who were Anita and Maria. So I remember that, and, having, and I remember we hustled ourselves out of there very fast. Uh, but I never f felt, you know, Paris was uh, uh, always, I, I never actually felt uh, any time that I had this, well, in New Haven, we, I would sneak in the back door of the pub, but I never made a big deal about it. I never felt terribly uh, oppressed. I never did. And you've, you've mentioned before we started filming, and you've just now again, that you um, remember yourself as being apolitical. Were there issues that you were involved with in the 60s, uh, whether it was anti-war or gay rights, or was, were you paying attention or thinking I about I really it? wasn't. I was so busy working on my music and, and my degrees that that's really all I thought about. And then the, any free time I had, it was to meet someone like Leslie or to spend time with other friends I met at, at Yale. I didn't, I was not, uh, I realize now it was a very political age, but I was not, uh, if someone had asked me to, to give a little history of the Vietnam War, I couldn't have done it with any kind of accuracy. I know a lot more about it now than I did then. Of course I was aware of these horrible photographs of, of um, I remember the child, I don't even remember, the, she was running nude. I, it was an iconic photograph, and I remember being appalled by that. But, but being, I wasn't caught up, I did not demonstrate, I did not, I, well, f I don't recall there being that much demonstration in New Haven at Yale at the time, frankly. I do know that we, while we were living in France, it was in 1968, and they, they had the huge riots in May, Soissons wheat, they call it, and de Gaulle was president, and they almost brought the government down. And it was very frightening. Leslie was rather paranoid. I, I wasn't terribly frightened by it. it. I found it to be a nuisance because everything closed. The, the subway, the metro closed. You couldn't, we had a phone, believe it or not, but you couldn't call out. Of the, the phone was very unreliable. There was no garbage pickup. Uh, there was no gas. Uh, quickly, the gas supplies ran out. Uh, and so for the whole month of May, and then, of course, in the Latin Quarter, the student quarter, I should say, uh, every night the students and the cops would square off and they would, uh, there would be a scuffle. And there would be tear gas. And, and Leslie, who was uh, born and bred in New York, was, he was very paranoid about this whole thing, possibly because he was Jewish. Uh, now, meanwhile, we, our French friends said, oh, it's nothing, you know, we have strikes like this all the time. Yes, it's been going on for three weeks, and it might go on another week or two, but don't worry about it. And they would joke and say, don't worry about it until they put, put up the guillotine at the Place de la Concorde. Then start worrying. But Leslie wanted to get out of there. But the problem was, we, meanwhile, I had gotten uh, an extension. I could stay another year. I'd done a great favor for my Fulbright advisor. And so she had said to me, uh, I had helped her place a student at, at Yale through some connections that I had. Uh, and she said, would, would you like to stay another year? If so, I, it can be arranged, and I will arrange it for you. And I said, well, yes, I think that might be a, a nice thing to do. But then these riots occurred, and Leslie was totally freaking out. And he, he, but I said, well, how can we get out of here? Because the ships, we came by ship, and all the ports were closed. 
But somehow we managed to, he managed to get us on a train that uh, we got a ferry and then got took it across the English Channel and then picked up the ship in Southampton and came back home. Uh, so I didn't stay the second year. And so we came back to New York. We arrived in July. Uh, I didn't have a job. We didn't have an apartment. Uh, I didn't have any money. So I got a job. Um, <laughs> uh, Vera, in those days they had IBM cards and they had these machines where they, uh, you would punch them. You, you would type something and it would punch the cards. And then they would be, uh, somehow they were sorted. And it would, had to do with the financial, I had to go downtown, it was financial district. And we would, uh, it was a part-time job. And I thought, well, I, I can't tell them that I have a degree from Yale, that I have a master's degree from Yale, they'll never hire me. So I told them that I had gone to junior college and that I was there. I had come to New York, I wanted to become a writer. And they believed it. And then I had to take an exam. Uh, and so this exam was, it was not difficult, but I was very careful with it. And everybody was just handing in their paper and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm the last one. I'll never get this job. Well, I don't know what the others put on their paper, but whatever it was, they hired me. And of course, then of course I had to stick to this little lie I'd made up that I had gone to junior college and I'd come to New York to be a novelist. And then of course, I totally forgot all about it. And then I don't know, weeks later, my supervisor came by and said, oh, by the way, what are the, uh, he had found out I was from the South, well, what are the Southern writers you like? Huh, what? Uh, it's like, oh, oh, well, uh, well, of course, there's Tennessee Williams, and, there's, and I was really, uh, you know, had to scramble quickly to think of, you know, what, F Flannery O'Connor? Uh, <laughs> whoever I could think of. Uh, so I kept that job, and then I got a job, uh, uh, they, in those days, they had a, uh, a series up in Riverside Park. Meanwhile, we had gotten an apartment, Leslie and I. We found an apartment on West End Avenue and uh, 94th Street, which in those days wasn't such a hot neighborhood. A lot of heroin. Uh, 700 West End Avenue. It was a one-bedroom apartment, which I was terrified about being able to pay the rent on. It was $186 a month. It was on the 16th floor, a river view uh, from even the bathroom. Uh, but $186 a month, I, what am I going to do to get this kind of money? Well, I got this little part-time job doing this verifying. I was what they called a verifier. And then I got a job, um, pretty soon after that, I got a job, um, that summer or later, I guess may, maybe later that summer, um, uh, they had a series of park free concerts in the park for the, uh, in Riverside Park, about 103rd Street, and they hired a little orchestra. So uh, it was conducted by a lady, uh, Mrs. Petrides, and uh, I got a job doing that, and it paid very little, but it was enough to pay the rent, and, and then through that I also uh, somehow made a connection, and I got a job playing in the Princeton Chamber Orchestra. I took an audition for the following winter, and I did that, and that we toured all over, and then I met all kinds of people in that group, including some people who played for the New York City Ballet Orchestra. And then through that connection, I got a job playing uh, as a sub in the New York City Ballet Orchestra. But in the meantime, also that summer when we first came, I was desperate for money before I got the verifying job. Uh, maybe it was during the part of the same time. I got a job subbing at Radio City. And that was a prison sentence because in those days they had, Radio City had, um, it was a movie house basically. And they had a movie, well first of all they had a stage show with the Rockettes from noon to one. And then there was a two hour movie. And then there was a sta the same stage show from uh, three, uh, yeah, right, 12 to one and then uh, from one to three was the movie. And then at three o'clock there was another stage show, the same stage show with the Rockettes from three to four. Then a movie that lasted until six. Then a stage show at six to seven. And then the last stage show was at nine. So you were stuck there from... 12 noon until 9 o'clock at night. Now you didn't do that much work, you did play four shows, but you were, it was, as I say, it was a, I thought of it as a prison sentence because you couldn't, two hours wasn't really enough to go back home to your apartment and then come back down there because you had to, the worst thing that could happen to you is you had to get on the stage which was way down at the bottom of Rockefeller Center and, the work, and they would ring this bell and God forbid you missed the pit because then they'd bring the whole thing up and if you weren't on the, the stage, then you, you missed your 
you know, being in the orchestra and you didn't get paid. So, uh, but I remember thinking, oh, I don't, whatever happens, don't do deliver me from this because there were these old guys that had been doing this for years. It paid very well, by the way. Uh, it was through Local 802. Um, but they were so jaded. All they did is sit around and play poker for two hours and then they'd play the show. And then and I think, no, uh, whatever. Don't let this happen to me. And so then I got a job uh, in the Princeton Chamber Orchestra and then New York City. All these, uh, then subbing in the New York City Ballet Orchestra. And then I got this job teaching at the university. Again, all of this thing, all this stuff fell in my lap. I didn't even, I didn't go after this stuff. And the, somebody called me through, meanwhile, because of the Riverside Drive concerts, I met someone who had a quartet. They, he had the Kohan Quartet. He had an opening for a cellist. Did, could I play in that? And he liked my playing, and so I did. I ended up doing that for 10 years, and we pl did a lot of recordings and did a lot of commercial work um, through the studios in New York. And through that connection, I met a woman. She was the violist in the quartet, Eugenie. And she said, there's a, uh, an opening at a university, well, in those days it was a college, in New Jersey for a cello teacher, are you interested? And I said, eh, I guess. And that was really my attitude. I just sort of like, eh. I was young, I didn't really, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. I was just sort of blasé about the whole thing. And now when I realized some of these things that fell into my lap, people would kill for. And so I said, yeah, and I forgot about it. Well, sure enough, they called me up. And that summer in June, they said, would you like to come out? And, and play for us, uh, for this job. And I said, yeah, I guess. And so I went out and I got the job. I much, it was a surprise to me. And uh, then I ended up staying, it was a great job. Where was this? It came, well, in those days they called it New York State University. It's in Union, New Jersey. It's part of the state system. It's now, uh, the, the, it started out as a normal college in Newark to teach young women how to teach school. And then by the time I got hired there, they had moved to a, a, a land that had formerly belonged to the Kane family of New Jersey, one of the big families in New Jersey. In fact, Tom Kane was governor after all. And it was a dairy farm that they had owned. And uh, the school had bought 120 acres of this farm and had moved the campus there. And they were expanding. And I was hired to be, to be in the music department and teach cello and other music subjects. What year was that? 1970. I was 28 years old. And uh, at the time I didn't have my doctorate and they said, well, we expect you to complete it. I had done a part of a doctorate when I was doing my work at Yale, but I hadn't finished it. And they, I said, well, I will finish it. And eventually I did. Um, but in the meantime, I, it, it turned out to be a good job. Uh, I got tenure. Again, I wasn't worried about any of these things. Now people sweat bullets about it. Um, and I stayed there for 36 years. And the great thing about it was I lived in New York City. It's a very short commute. It's about 18 miles. It's very close to Newark Airport. And meanwhile, the, the school grew and grew. It became a university. They added uh, graduate departments. And when I retired in 06, I guess it was, um, I guess we had about 13, 14,000 students, including grad students. Um, so it was, and yet I was still able to do all my freelance work in New York and live here in New York. So it was, I mean, I've lived, a, I've, I'm telling you, I've lived a charmed life. I've always had great friends. I've had, I've been blessed so far with good health. Um, no complaints. I've always had a great place to live. I've never lived uh, in a place that was not quite pleasant. Uh, I've just, I've just been one lucky son of a gun. There you go. So I'm going to take us back to 1969. Where were you in June of 1969? During the Stonewall thing. Yeah. Leslie and I, well, we originally were on 94th and West End, 700 West End, as a lot of heroin. One day he was walking back, uh, he was in a beautiful leather coat, and his father, his father was, uh, Leslie came, his father, they were upper middle class. The, his father was an attorney. They had money. They lived at 2 Fifth Avenue. And his father had given him a beautiful Barry sculpture. So there was Leslie coming from the subway on 94th 
down night, just was very short block to our door and this leather coat carrying this beautiful piece of sculpture. And apparently someone tried to mug him. It was probably a junkie. Uh, uh, nothing happened, but it scared the bejesus out of him. He said, we got to get out of here. I said, well, where, where are we going to go? In the meantime, he said, from now on, we're going to get out of the subway at 86th Street and we'll either walk or take a cab. We won't get out at 96th Street. There was an entrance on 94th Street. Well, I found this ridiculous, but I went along with it. So, sure enough, he insisted that we move. So we moved to the east side. Not only the east side, thank you, 1060 Park Avenue. So we were living at 1060 Park Avenue. And that was when all of the riots occurred. And we were living on the second floor, and next to us, next door to us, were two gay guys. Now, Leslie was a painter, and I was a musician, so we were kind of bohemian. Uh, the two guys next to us were so buttoned down and so preppy, I mean, it was just like, you know, Mutt and Jeff between the two. So we weren't, we were friendly with them in the sense that we, hi, how are you, what are you, what? but we really didn't share a lot in common. Well, when this thing happened, I hadn't, I, I knew who Judy Garland was, of course, the Wizard of Oz, but I didn't, I, have, I was unaware totally that she had become this, uh, somehow the gay community had just adopted her because of her. I knew that the studios had her when she was a child actress. Uh, uh, they gave her drugs, ups and downs, and, and that she had had a drug problem, but I hadn't realized somehow she had somehow connected with the larger gay community at least in New York and on this particular day and I don't know whether it was the day she died or whether it was the day of her funeral uh, the guys next door were just beyond grief and Leslie and I were saying oh oh what a shame but you know uh, you know it's a, a tragedy but but they were I mean it was a big thing they were just grief stricken and I think it was that night that the original riot started at Stonewall. Because in those days, of course, a lot of the bars were controlled by the Mafia. I was in, I, I don't recall ever being in the Stonewall until after the actual uh, event had happened. I did go in afterwards. But I'd been in other bars that had been Mafia controlled and they were raided regularly. The cops would come in and, uh, if, you know, I guess if you didn't pay off the way they wanted or whatever, and they would raid raid the place and throw you out and sometimes arrest you. I never got arrested because when they came in, I, you know, I didn't, I was not sassy at all. I would just say, oh, well, I just wandered in here by accident, <laughs> some bullshit story, <laughs> and they would let me go. Uh, so that's where we were when it happened. And then I, then I started uh, hearing about the big ruckus and everything, and I, and, uh, I was amazed by it all. And then, of course, the following year, they, I think they had the first gay pride parade, and I did go. I was, I was, I've got to go to this. So, did you before that? Did you know about the Mattachine Society? I had read about that, and I knew they had a magazine called One, and I knew the women had something called the Daughters of Bilitis or something mm -hmm. like that. But it didn't. Again, I was so wrapped up in my own little world. My little world at that time was, well, when I was in school, it was obviously a school. I, had, I was very busy in school because not only did I have a lot of school work, I was playing in the New Haven Symphony, the New Haven Opera Company, so I didn't have any time uh, to speak of, uh, to be on my own. I had very little time to get into trouble. And so I didn't, un unfortunately, didn't get into nearly as much trouble as I wish I had gotten into, but I was, uh, but probably it worked out in the, all for the best in the end. And then I, w I was on this Fulbright with Leslie. We were in France, and so I was tied up with that. I mean, that was a, uh, I, was, I took that very seriously. And then we came back here, and then I thought, my God, I've got to find a way to earn a living. Um, so I was preoccupied with that and trying to get ahead in the music world. So I, you know, it, it, it didn't leave a lot of time. I mean, I think I mentioned to you at one point, I had just gotten a job at the university. I was playing a Broadway show. I was working seven days a week, so I did not have time to, you know, I wasn't involved with anything except just doing that. So but when you heard that Stonewall happened, what was your sense of what it meant? And I was glad. I, I thought, well, it's about time. 
because I remember being in bars when uh, when the cops would raid, and they were so rude and so crude. You you know, you fags get out of here, and you know that kind of thing. Uh, I thought, yeah, okay, it's about time. Uh, the, 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 and I and later on, this was some you know the, the, this saying came out: "We're queer, we're here, get used to it." I thought, right on. I loved all of that, but I never was really uh, that involved. Uh, after Leslie and I broke up, um, later I met someone who was involved with. Uh, GLAD, which is a, an organization uh, to monitor the press about things that were said about uh, the LBGT issues. And he was very involved in ACT UP, so I used to go to ACT UP with him. And I love those, I love those meetings. And Northrop was one of the uh, moderators, and Roll Arena was there, and those, it was just wonderful. I mean, the spirit was just terrific. Did I ever get out on the barricades? No, I didn't do that. So tell me about 1970, though. You did go to the first, that was the first yeah. march. Can you, do, do you remember that day? Can you tell me about I, it? Well, I remember being astounded at how many people were there. Uh, that was the first thing. It was like, whoa. Uh, and the diversity of the groups. Uh, I had been rather, I mean, I, I guess intellectually I knew that there were, you know, in New York City, a city like New York City, I mean, there are many different groups and many different economic levels and so forth, but the, what I had known in my world were just basically upper middle class or middle class gay guys who mostly were well educated. And then there were all these, you know, dykes on bikes and, uh, oh wow, just all kinds of other things. Uh, and so that was an eye opener. And the, the sheer numbers and the enthusiasm, I, I was, uh, I just loved it. I thought that was a great thing. And I knew at the time, I thought, you know, Ted, you'll probably never really get out there on the barricades. And, but I, 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 I really gave a lot of credit for those who did. Did you march? Oh, yeah, I did. I walked. And then later on, I had a, 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 a lover who was in the Gay Men's Chorus, and I always used to uh, walk with that group. Um, and then later on, uh, Ray and I would uh, w uh, march in the parade. Uh, he was a board member of Hedrick Martin, and so they had a, we would march with that group. Uh, so I marched in a number of them, uh, and I never was worried about... Now, he told me uh, that his first time after... Of course, Ray had been married, and he, had, uh, he has two daughters, and the, the first one he marched in, he was terrified that his ex-wife would find out. And uh, because in those days, the courts were not very sympathetic to gay fathers. Uh, and he, as it was, he was having a lot of trouble seeing his daughters. His ex-wife would, she lived in Vermont. She moved back to Vermont and took the girls with her. And of course he was paying, you know, he gave them money and child support and all of that. And he would arrange to drive up there to have a, a, a Saturday with them, and he'd drive five hours one way, and then she would say, oh, they're not here. They have, and she would do horrible things to him. And so he was very concerned the first time he um, marched that, that, you know, he was also teaching the you know, city public school system. That was another thing that worried him, but he did march. And then slowly things got better, and to the point where, well, I told you earlier that Leslie, who taught it, uh, it uh, he ended up teaching at Stuyvesant. He was very paranoid about writing, uh, painting anything that was uh, sexual or uh, homoerotic and putting his own name on it. So any, any of these nudes back here, you'll notice that it's not his name. It's Lloyd Hamilton. Okay. One second. Could we maybe ask Ray to turn down? Do you hear he's listening? I, he's watching. Yeah, just knock on the door, ask him okay? to turn it down. Ray's, Ray's a little hard of hearing. Ray! Can you knock on the door? Okay, sorry. <laughs> we can just hear you if you don't mind. Oh, 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 okay. Can you turn down the. Uh... Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, God. Would you like another Greek? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm rambling too much. No, you're a wonderful storyteller. You're, you're pretty much perfect. Really? Really? Well, I'm going off right. topic. No, there isn't such a thing. We're really interested in your life and 
your life relates to the time, so it's really good. Mark, is it? It's really just lovely. Did you, do you remember if you saw the poster for the 1970 march? It's a kind of a joyful group of young people coming up the street and it says, come out. It's a famous... Yes, I do remember seeing that. I don't think the rainbow flag was there yet, was it? No, yeah. no, no, that was a later thing. So do you remember how you knew the march was happening? Was it from the poster or how did you know? You know, that's a very good question. It might have been word of mouth. Someone probably said to me, oh, you know, there's going to be a gay march. And I, 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 I'm sure at the time I thought, what? A gay march? How can this be? And that's, I, uh, and if I recall, and maybe, you know, memory is very faulty. And did it start uptown and go downtown that first time? It went the other way around? It went up 6th Avenue. Maybe it was, okay. It started and, where? At Washington Square Park? Uh, I'm not sure where it started. It went up 6th Avenue. And then it ended in sort of a B in, kind of a gay in. Central, Central Park. Park, yes, I do remember that. Okay, all right. I, I remember where, when I got to wherever it started, I was, my memory was wrong. I thought it started uptown and somehow went downtown. But, and I do remember, but now that you said Central Park, that part I remember. So I remember being struck by how many people were there and, and the diversity. And that was one thing that just blew me away because I did not, in my little narrow world, I, I was unaware of all of that. I mean, yes, I had gone, I didn't go into that many bars and of course in bars, you know, you, they're different folks, but I didn't pay too much attention to any of that. I didn't think too much about it. And again, most of the time, I mean, I was very self-centered. I was busy, you know, in my career. I've got to, you know, I've got to make a living because I did not have, um, I, I, I'm sure had I, contacted my parents and said, look, I need some money. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. I really very much wanted to be on my own. And I didn't care what I had to do. If I had to work on Wall Street, if I had to, you know, I, you know, I would have scrubbed toilets if I had, had to do so. It turned out that I was lucky. I had a little stint on Wall Street doing this uh, a drudgery job. Uh, which I was not very good at, I don't think. I probably would have gotten fired if I hadn't quit. Uh, but for the most part, I was so busy trying to, you know, make it in the music world, which is hard then. It's impossible now. If I had a, if I had a child who said they wanted to go into music in, uh, in New York, I would advise them against it because I would say, wait a minute, it's just too hard now. It was it was difficult when I did it, but I did. I had so many breaks, and, I, and luck was so much a part of it. I just happened to be at the right place. At the, for example, the Radio City gig that I got. How did I get that gig? I didn't even know him, but he had gone to the Eastman School of Music. The contractor for, uh, in those days, for Radio City was a guy who had gone to... So I just called him up. I said, I'm so-and-so. I was at the Eastman School of Music. Oh, he said, well, you probably know so-and-so. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, I need a, a gig a job. Can you, he said, well, you can sub. And so that's how I got that job. And then, 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 then once I got to know the other cellist, I'd sometimes get a call from one of them saying, I can't take it another day. Can you come in and play for me tomorrow? And that's, you know, I would do that. So I, I would, it was just luck. So much of it was luck. I, I think, I, I don't think of it was, it was not plotting and scheming on my part. Because generally the plotting and scheming I did fizzled out. <laughs> It was the things that were serendipity by luck that panned out, like the job in, in uh, New Jersey. I, mean, I, I couldn't have, if I had plotted and schemed, I couldn't have gotten that job. It just turned out, and this woman, she knew somebody, and the next thing I knew, I had this job. It was one of those things. So tell me about your life uh, sort of in the early 70s, after the first march. Um, so Leslie is careful in his work world, because he needs to be. Oh, yeah. He... he <laughs> Sure. Uh, yes, he definitely was worried about that. I, and some, I, I think it was necessary to some degree, but as I mentioned earlier, Leslie tended to be a little paranoid anyway. Uh, and I think maybe he, and, and I may be wrong about this, 
because he was not a flamboyant guy at all. In fact, if you'd met Leslie uh, and he didn't tell you where he was gay, I you might not realize it, at, at least at first. Uh, but he he was very concerned about that. Uh, so he he kept a very low profile. He he was very careful at school at Stuyvesant. Uh, he was highly regarded, um, and he did not want to rock the boat there. That was a very good job. Can uh, you tell me about his painting, the ones that he painted under... Um, Lloyd Hamilton? Yeah, tell me about that. Well, he, as I say, Leslie, he, he painted... Uh, you know, paintings like this. Every summer, for example, he, he would take his easel outdoors and paint uh, outdoor scenes. And I have some of them. His sister, uh, Roberta, who lives in Chicago, she has some of them. Uh, I have some of them in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And um, so he would paint, uh, there were generally two kinds of paintings. He would do outdoor scenes, or sometimes an indoor, sometimes it would be a still life inside, you know, a vase of flowers, or something like that. Or it would be an erotic uh, painting of a male nude, like those in the hall. Uh, and, and those, uh, the way those came about, many of them came about, uh, Leslie and I broke up in 73, and he moved to 72nd Street, and I moved to Riverside Drive. We remained friends. Uh, but we were, had realized that we were it was just, we couldn't live together anymore. So that was, uh, so he was painting, and I posed, I still posed for him. There's a big painting, I think his sister has it, of me on a bicycle, and he painted it on his, in, in his apartment on 72nd Street. And I, what I remember about posing for it was, it is really hard to sit on a bicycle and you're not moving. And for hours, uh, I remember that. That was the thing, and I thought, this is beyond. I mean, it's one thing to sit, uh, and he painted, another one he painted of me that has a very interesting story, and that actually is a huge one in the, in the bedroom. He painted this huge portrait of me. What had happened, he and I had gone to, we were living on Park Avenue at the time, and I remember the night before we had gone to that movie called Deliverance. And I'm not sure what year that came out, but whatever it was, it was maybe 71, 72, something like that. Um, and the next day he said, oh, pose for, it was summertime. He said, pose for me. I said, Leslie, I'm coming down with a cold or something. I don't feel well. He said, just lie on the sofa. Take your clothes off. I'll paint you nude. I said, okay, fine. So I'm lying on the sofa. And he paints me nude. And after we broke up, he took the photo, he took the painting and then someone saw it and wanted it. He said, but I can't, but you have to put pants on it. So Leslie put pants on it. And it was a barter arrangement. I remember that. Leslie told me that the guy, the guy lived in the Dakota. Leslie was living on 77th Street, 72nd Street in the Oliver Cromwell, which was right across the street from the Dakota. He somehow met this guy in the Dakota. Uh, and the guy wanted to see his artwork. He saw this portrait of me, which Leslie had, and he wanted it, but he wanted pants on it, which Leslie said, fine. So he put a pair of cut-off jeans. And then he didn't pay Leslie. He gave him a Petit Philippe watch in exchange for the painting. And then later, and this is where I don't know how it came about because Leslie and I weren't living together. Later, somehow, he got the painting back. And then when Leslie died, I ended up with a painting. And it's hanging in this room in here with pants on it. Didn't take the <laughs> pants back off, huh? No, he never took the pants back off. <laughs> so, but he, but, uh, so as I say, Leslie was concerned. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, as I say, just regular paintings, uh, outdoor scenes like this. This particular one um, is up near Columbia. Um, and then, but he would always paint outside with his easel, and then, uh, or he would sometimes do inside. He would do a still life, as I say, with a, a vase, or a, and, and you could always recognize his paint. I could because I knew the objects. We lived together for seven years, and so well, I know that dish, I know that vase, I know, yeah, I because I lived with it for all those years. Uh, and then the other things he would do is he would do these these uh, nudes, male nudes, 
And when he was, uh, one of the uh, ways he would get models, and he was very, up, you know, he was really straightforward about it, he would call, uh, one of the places he used to call was the student uh, employment office at Columbia. And he would say, look, I'm an artist, I do uh, nudes. And he did some female nudes as well, but mostly male nudes. And he would say, um, this is what I need. It, it, you must tell the student they have to pay, they have to be willing to pose nude. There's no hanky panky. I pay them. This is how much I pay them, whatever the going rate was. And, uh, but if they're uptight about doing that, don't even send them over here because I am an artist and I will, that's what I'm doing right now. And so a lot of these young men here, I don't even know their names. I don't even know if Leslie knew their names, uh, came from Columbia and, um, they would come and, and you know they needed you know, they were students they needed money and so he it was a very legitimate thing he would pay them and they would pose and it was mostly they would either be standing that one there for example is he's standing uh, and all of those objects in that painting are, were from the apartment uh, then there's another one on the other wall the guy's seated um, and they're not they're not what I would call pornographic but they're they're explicit I mean they're they're male dudes and did he think of that as um, a political act? No, I think he got off on it. I think it was a sexual, uh, in a weird way, a, uh, a sexual release for him. Uh, when, I, when I first met him, we met in the Baths in 1967, he was, he was painting huge male movies, and I don't know where they ever got to, uh, uh, but, but much more abstract, but very... Uh, they were pretty, there was never any, uh, they were not pornographic, there was never any depictions of sex or anything like that, but they were pretty, it was pretty explicit as to what it was. I mean, it was, it was a very homoerotic painting, and they were huge, huge. So let me ask you, um, you said that you went to ACT UP meetings with a later partner? Yes, Robert. Was that your, was that kind of the, the next time that you did something that was kind of overtly... Yes, yeah. it was. Can you tell me about that? Uh, I loved going to those meetings, and I, and I was just... I admired so much some of the leaders of that group who were... They were out there. They were putting their ass on the line. Uh, I remember particularly Ann Northrop. Um, uh, there were others. Um, um, Peter... I think he's passed away. Peter Staley was his name. They were willing to go out and actually lie in the street and stop traffic. I mean, I never did that. I did. I would go to the meeting, and I gave them money, by the way. I, I would make contributions, um, and I, I I really believed very much in what they. And of course, out of that came ACT UP. Uh, no longer exists, but there's something called uh, what the hell is it called? It's something having to do with AIDS. Treatment Action Group or something like that. And it, it grew out of that group in which they, doctors who were members of ACT UP, uh, and about that time, of course, AIDS was hitting pretty hard. Uh, they were, they banded together and were uh, really trying to pressure uh, the CDC and other organizations like that to, hey, you know, you've got to do a lot more research. There's, uh, this is a horrible crisis. Um, I remember Ronald Reagan wouldn't even say anything until finally Rock Hudson, uh, you know, that whole thing happened. So uh, all those political organizations, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Lambda Legal, I, I always attend their fundraisers in Fort Lauderdale. They have a huge one every March, uh, give them money. Uh, I think it's very important. Lambda Legal, of course, is the legal end of things, and they take things to the courts. Uh, they've been very important. Uh, I knew vaguely uh, Edie Winsler, uh, Windsor. Uh, I was so proud of her and a lot. I mean, I've never been really out there on the barricades kind of guy. I'm just stuck me. Uh, although now, with the political situation the way it is now, I'm thinking maybe it's about time because things are really pretty awful. Pretty awful. I mean, we've come a long way. I mean, Ray and I are married. We're, we were able to get married. We'd, uh, we've been together. Well, we'll in October, it will be 25 years. Uh, Congratulations. And, yes. yes it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and 
as I say, we're lucky because our parents uh, and his children uh, are unbelievably supportive. Unbelievably supportive. Uh, Can you tell me about getting married? It was so interesting. What we did was um, we went down to, it's not City Hall, but you know the place downtown. And it's an old, it's a wonderful old building which they really fixed up. They didn't screw up the wonderful architectural details, you know, sometimes they do. Uh, but this, in this building, bless their hearts, they did not. All the molding and everything was there. And we went on, um, we thought, well, it's going to be a mob scene. Let's go on a day that's like a Jewish holiday and probably there won't be too many people there. Wrong. So we went, I think it was Rosh Hashanah. It was like September 4th on that year. We went there. We had, had to go down earlier, I think, to get the license and all of that. So we had done that a couple of weeks before. And then we thought, well, there won't be anybody there. Well, it was packed. Um, but interesting people. There was a couple of, I, they had come from uh, St. Louis. And they were African American. I'm pretty sure the groom at one time had been a woman. Not sure for a fact, but I would be willing to bet a little money on that one. And his wife was very femme. And we talked. We were in line with them. There was a long line. And uh, it was. And then of course there were two chapels, and so we were all in line waiting for all of this. And so we talked with them. And then there was another couple I remember, and they were two uh, women. Um, one was rather large, and she was in one of those motorized chairs, and uh, she was dressed very casually. Uh, uh, Ray and I were in uh, mat uh, trousers and uh, matching uh, shirts and ties, but they were very casual. She was in her motorized chair, and she had a baseball cap on, and at the back, you know, there's an opening of the baseball cap, and out of that was a little white veil. And walking alongside her was her partner, who was as thin as she was large. And this was obviously, uh, she was uh, the, the, the man in the family, because she was very tough. And she had on a t-shirt, it was rolled up, she had a cigarette behind her ear, and there was a pack of matches or cigarette in the, and they were, I thought, well, that's an interesting group. There was another group of, uh, well, they seemed to be straight. I don't know what the deal was. Uh, and they were dressed, I mean, he had on ripped jeans and she was in this ratty old house dress. Uh, and all of the, the people with them were dressed in a similar fashion. I call them the grunge couple, but they were, it was fun to watch all that. Uh, then there was another couple, and I think uh, she appeared to be Indian, uh, from India, I mean. A little, you know, mark, and very nicely dressed in a sari and all of that. And he was taller. Uh, he seemed to be Caucasian. Um, so it was very interesting. And then the ceremony itself was lovely. I mean, the 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 people who officiate, and then afterwards, uh, Ray's younger daughter and her husband Tom were our witnesses. And then we went to the Yale Club and had a celebratory dinner. And I had invited several people to join us, friends of ours. We, uh, Gray and I play bridge, so these were some of our bridge partners. And um, his younger daughter, Ty, had called ahead and had a table outside. It was nice weather on the, on, at the roof dining room, and they had a big table set up for us out there, and she had flowers and everything. And the interesting thing about it was, of course, uh, it was a very celebratory meal and all of that, and there were people who were coming over and saying, oh, what's the occasion? And so we would say, well, no, we got married. And the response was just overwhelmingly positive. Oh, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I, 25 years before, it, I could not have imagined such a thing. I mean, so we've really come a long way. And what uh, did it mean to you that you could get married and to be married? It was symbolic more than anything else. I mean, uh, we had already set up any of our financial things so that if something happened to me, he would get things, uh, but it, and vice versa. And our, his daughters know, knew that, and, uh, and my, my sister and brother knew all of that. Uh, but it was a symbolic thing. And you know, we have rings, matching rings. Uh, uh, he wanted a bigger ring, and I said, look, 
if I have to, if I'm going to wear it on my left hand, I'm a cellist. I ha cannot have this big, humongous ring. A little teeny thing like this, I can negotiate. But you know, some people like these big, wide. I couldn't do that. I could. I still play the cello even at my age. Um, so I said, if we can get little rings, that's fine. So we did that. I think the, uh, the idea of equality and every aspect of the word, I think, is, is, is just absolutely as it must be. And to see the current politicians try to backpedal on that, I was very disappointed about the thing that didn't go our way with the Supreme Court and the baker. Yes. Now, mind you, if a baker did not want to make a cake for me, I would not have them make it. I did see the movie The Help and read the book. So I'm not about to go to a baker and say, I'm making you make this cake even though I know you don't want to make it. Uh, but, as, as so many people have pointed out, it's not about the cake. It's about the fact that you, you cannot say you're, you're a business and you cannot say, oh, I don't want to serve you because I don't like who you are. You know, you have blonde hair. I only like brunettes. And that's kind of the kind of bullshit it is, at least in my opinion. I agree. Yeah. So, I, I, I think any, anything that we can do as a gay community to, uh, again, I, I, I'm very interested in supporting the legal end of things because I think in the long run that's where we're going to, where our rights are going to be won is in the courts. I mean, not that these other things aren't important. I, and believe me, I've given money to AMFAR and, and, uh, for the AIDS thing. I've given money to GMHC uh, to help, uh, you know, I, uh, God's Love We Deliver. I, I give money to them regularly to help people who, uh, well, it used to be mostly people with AIDS. Now I think they've expanded it to help other people who are ill with other diseases. And so... Uh, you know, Ray and I, and Ray's very, he's more political than I am. He gives money to uh, democratic causes, and so we get on all these lists, and the phone rings all the time, wanting for us to give more money. So, what should I understand? I mean, they need money, because there are political fights in all, every corner of the country, especially now. Uh, what did you think about um, President Obama making the Stonewall and the little park in front of it? Oh, that was perfect. Way? I think that was, it should have been. Is why absolutely it's part of American history. It's absolutely a part of American history, and a part of it's part of civil rights struggle. I mean, for so many years, uh, gay people had been uh, marginalized, uh, pushed in the background. Uh, in my own particular case, it didn't have a huge impact on my life, but many people it did. I mean, there were people who got thrown out of their homes. I mean. As I said, Ray was on the board of Hedrick Martin, and there were kids there that going to the school, the, the school that's been run by the Hedrick Martin. The Harvey Milk School. Harvey Milk School. That had been, their parents found out and they threw them out. We have a, a buddy of ours uh, that we met in uh, Fort Lauderdale. We call him one of our beach buddies. It's a little, it's a little small gay beach, uh, not too far from where our apartment is, and we go there frequently. Uh, there's a big, larger one further down, and it's where all the young, young boys go. Uh, this one is, I call it a beach for gentlemen who are no longer young. And we've met several people there that we've become fast friends with, one of whom is a man from Canada, from Vancouver. He's a retired attorney. When he was 18, his father found out he was gay and threw him out of the house. And so he... This was in Windsor, where he, his family lives, and he moved to Vancouver, drove buses, did anything he could to put himself through college and law school, had a successful career, is now retired and living in uh, Vancouver, and then has uh, a winter apartment in Fort Lauderdale, actually in our building, as it turns out. So, <coughs> I had a friend, he's, he's died now, but... He was from the south, mm -hmm. my building, and his family rejected him. His whole like, he had the same partner for forty years, and it it, it was he was just gone from the family. Yeah, it, it's. Okay. Oh, okay. We're gonna change the card. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things, fifties, Dorothy Draper, she did the Waldorf Astoria that, and she also did that famous resort in um, 
in West Virginia, Greenbrier or whatever. It's a big, very fancy hotel. She, and she was a society decorator. And Jimmy Draper was her adopted son. <clears throat> he now lives with his partner in Spartanburg, my hometown, and my sister knows him. And uh, I've met him, and he and his partner, Gabe, well, Ray and I were down there visiting my sister, and he gave a cocktail party for us. And so at the cocktail party were these Trump supporters, and it's like, I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't believe, why are you here? But they were totally comfortable. So it was, it was like, you know, I couldn't quite get my head around this. I mean, I, I and, and obviously we're, they adored Jimmy Draper and his partner, and trust me, when you meet Jimmy Draper, there is no doubt about his sexual orientation. I mean, one whole room of the house, first of all, the, he, the house, he was an interior designer like his mother was, so the, the, he has just decorated the shit out of the house beautifully. I mean, there are all kinds of wonderful paintings and object d'art, and, you know, you're just, you know, it's got beautiful things. One whole room in the house is nothing but a doll collection. Uh, I've never been in anything like that. I mean, I'm, I don't think of myself as being super butch, but I've never been involved. I drag, I, don't, I can't see myself. Do, I mean, have I done it? Yes. Uh, but I, it's, I would only do it in a camp sense of the word. I would never try to my, make myself look real. You know, there, were, there are people who want to look real. I mean, I think, okay, that's a lot of work. <laughs> you can do that if you want to. That's not me. Uh, but I, uh, this whole thing in the South where they're, at least where my sister lives, uh, she and her husband are very, very liberal and democratic and uh, very strongly supportive of liberal causes and progressive causes. And yet, some of their friends are just people that you think, how are you out of your mind? How can you support this man? It's it's not understandable. I don't. I don't. No. Think. Well, there. Are, I think there's some people who really would have to end a friendship over that. Uh, I and I'm, I asked my sister about it. She says, "Well, no." She said, "I. I. We just don't talk about it." Uh, I think they've come to a mutual realization that they, they have to agree to disagree on that issue. And so that's that. But I mean, they've been friends since they were you know, in the yeah. kindergarten, even before. Wow. So when you think about the, the monument now, does it um, make you think about, kind of reflect on your life and the path that you've taken? Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Well, I, I feel that... Um, in some ways, I think, you know, Ted, you should have been more active. You should have been out there on the barricades more. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't castigate myself because of that. Um, I know that, that my partner my, uh, was definitely more involved. He was much more out there than I have been. Um, so we, and as I say, uh, we do give money to liberal causes, um, the fact that the monument, the Stonewall uh, Monument in, in Greenwich Village, I mean, I mean, it should be on the National Register of Historic Places. It is historic. I mean, it's, it's actually, it was started the whole thing. You go all over the world, and, and they have uh, pride marches uh, in Toronto, all over the world. Even, even oppressive uh, places, they manage to eke out something oftentimes. And so I think it's, uh, it's part of world history, and I, I'm very proud of it. I think it's an important thing, and I think this idea of doing the oral history project. I mean, there's a woman that Bray and I know. She's, uh, we met her on the North Fork. She is a lesbian, and she, for many years, was a, with a partner, Peggy. Peggy passed away a couple of years ago. And Diane uh, doesn't come out there very much anymore. Diane's pushing 90. And I remember saying, uh, we, we had become friends with her we, because... Uh, uh, her house, we, we, our house had deeded beach rights to a beach on Long Island Sound, and to get to, down to the beach, we would walk right past her house. And so many times, she, when, especially when Peggy was alive, would see us down there, and she would say, look, when you guys finish at the beach, come up, have a glass of wine. And so we would, we'd go, in, and she would start telling her stories. And I remember saying to her, uh, uh, you, sh this, you should write this down. 
because she used to go, she knew everybody, uh, and there are pictures of her. Uh, she lived in the south of France. Uh, she was a self-made woman. She grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, they had an outhouse, thank you. Her father had abandoned her, um, but she educated herself. She would come in and do standing room at the Metropolitan Opera. And so she's a highly educated, I mean, self-educated woman. She doesn't have college degrees or anything. I don't even think she has a high school degree, but you'd never know that if you talk to her. She became uh, Liz Smith's sort of uh, uh, right-hand uh, gal Friday, so to speak. If you, they were lovers at one time, in fact. Uh, and she has these incredible stories. In her house in South Hall, she has pictures of her with Dirk Bogart, with Elizabeth Taylor, with this one, with that one. And, and Diane herself, when she was young, was quite a babe. I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous woman. And, I, and Ray and I said to her, you need to write this down. This is, oh, why? I said, but it's part of gay history. She used to go out to Fire Island before they had electricity, and you had to pump your own water. She knew Truman Capote when he was out there writing, I don't know whether it was Breakfast at Tiffany's or one of the, uh, one of the early things, when he was a young... They didn't, uh, he would come in, she was a cashier at the, she was very young at the local grocery store, and he would say, oh, let's go up to the hotel and dance, and they had to crank up the Victrola, and they would put on a record and dance for a while, and stories like that. And I think that's, uh, I, I, I'm going to give you her name. Whether, at this point, whether she'll remember all, she, should, she probably remembers all of that, and she probably doesn't remember what she had for breakfast, but she, if she would be willing to do it, she would be someone you should talk to. Thank you. I think. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, she has stories that I, th I was fascinated by them. Definitely. I would yeah. love that. So let me ask you, when you think about um, the future, what are, what are your hopes for gay rights? Well, first of all, I certainly hope that they can uh, stop in the tracks this movement that now uh, fueled by the evangelicals and uh, current politicians uh, about trying to chip away at gay rights, and by doing it through things like uh, like this Baker. Oh well, it was uh, uh, my First Amendment rights, uh, my freedom of religion. I don't want to bake a cake for someone because they're gay. I don't want to. Uh, that needs to be stopped in its tracks. Uh, I think gay people should have absolutely every single right uh, that straight people have. Absolutely every single right, without question, without question. And I'm hoping that that can be, uh, particularly now, uh, can be uh, solidified so that there is no question. Because it actually does worry me that they are, they will be able to somehow, depending on who they who Trump. Points to because Ginsburg, she's going to soon have to retire or die or something, and they and you know he'll put some uh, very very conservative individual in there, um, and the court has an enormous uh, influence, and I think things like that are are a danger for us, for other people as well, but uh, I, that worries me. I, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I, I don't think it's not in the bag yet by a long shot. I think we've got a long way to go. I think we've gone an enormous. When I think back how far we have gone, it's, it's amazing. But the battle is not won by any stretch of the imagination. And the young people, I'm, I have to tell you, uh, they have energy, they have ideals, and uh, you know, I look back on my life and I think, oh, Ted, you were too damn bourgeois your whole fucking life. You know, you, know, you wanted to live in a nice apartment. You're not, you know. Well, that's who I am. That's what I did. And it's too late to change that now. Uh, but I'm glad to see that young people are out there uh, doing it. Uh, that I think you're great. <laughs> Thank you. So is there anything you want to tell me before we say goodbye and turn off the camera? No, well, I think you, yeah. But I, anything, I'm not going to tell you to delete any of this because it's all the God's truth as I remember it. Great, thank you. Thank you, it's been a great pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I hope it's useful. It's wonderful. Okay. It's really great. I'm going to take off my little skirt. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. I mean, I'm, you have to sit here and 